Welcome to Living with Reality, a podcast featuring archived teachings and modern conversations with Dr. Robert Svoboda, brought to you by the Be Here Now Network. Living with Reality explores Ayurveda and other wisdom traditions of India, which Dr. Svoboda has been studying for nearly 50 years. For more information, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Dr. Svoboda. That's D-R-S-V-O-B-O-D-A. Hello and welcome to Living with Reality. I'm Paula Crossfield, your host and Dr. Svoboda's media manager. On today's episode, Dr. Svoboda talks about determining what is real and looks at the Indian system of thought as a way to understand truth. We really hope you enjoy this episode. Please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a comment if you enjoy it. And also you can learn along with Dr. Svoboda on his online courses, which are located at drsvoboda.teachable.com. Enjoy the episode. Namaste. I'm Dr. Robert. And my subject for this particular podcast is determining what is real. How to ascertain what is what. This is a subject that has been occupying the minds and attention of human beings for many thousands of years. And in a less than rational way, it has been occupying the attention of living beings for millions, if not billions of years. Because mirages have always been around. We hear things that aren't really there. We, 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 our senses don't always function properly. So there is always the question of how do we determine what is really accurate, what is really true, what is really real. The word in Sanskrit for truth is satya. It comes from the word sat, which means true. And that word sat comes from the root as, A-S, which means to be to exist. So things that are true have to have some actual reality in fact. You will say, well, there are spiritual truths. And I will say, yes, these spiritual truths have actual reality in fact. If you follow certain practices and you focus in a particular way, you can experience what other people have experienced. Our experiences are not always accurate. Our experience are not always experiences are not always true. So there is that question of how do we determine what is what? How can we prove to ourselves that something is accurate? Possibly the best place to begin is the methods that have been employed traditionally in India. There are different sets of methods depending on how you were taught them in the context of which subject. I was taught them first in the context of Ayurveda, and that's how I will describe them. There are four, four methods of determining what is accurate and real, of proving a surmise or a hypothesis. The first is pratyaksha. Pratyaksha literally means in front of your eyes. So that means direct experience, direct perception. Not just with the eye, with any of the sense organs, but directly seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, feeling something. As long as your senses are working properly, as long as your ability to 
identify and interpret what your senses are sensing, as long as that is working properly, then there is some hope that in fact, this method of proof will be valid. But as we know, sometimes what we see, what we hear, these are not precisely accurate. There's an old English saying, believe only half of what you see and nothing of what you hear. What this means is Anytime you hear or see something that you need to know whether it is true or not, you should accept that you may have an accurate perception through your senses, but it still needs to be confirmed somehow. There has to be some sort of confirmation. Unfortunately, humans also suffer from something called confirmation bias. There are many biases, and all of these biases influence how we are able to employ our rational minds. And it is for this reason that I think the rational mind should not be relied upon too strongly for this purpose. The intuition is the thing that we should rely on more strongly, but we'll come to intuition in a moment. So the first, and of the four methods of knowledge, the most reliable is personally experiencing it. Or as they say in Italian, il modo migliore per imparare è spatendo la testa contro il muro. The best way to learn something is to beat your head against the wall. Because then you know, that's this is my head, that's the wall, and if I beat my head against the wall, I will get a particular result. Direct experience, direct perception. Often is reliable, not always, but often is reliable. Particularly if you are clear about what you are perceiving, and especially nowadays, you test and confirm. The second method is inference or anuman. And the traditional example that's employed is yatra yatra dumaha, tatra tatra wanihi. Wherever there is smoke, there is fire. It's not the case the other way around because sometimes you will have fire without there being smoke. But, and sometimes it will look like smoke, but it will actually be steam. Or if it's far enough away, it might be a, a giant a cloud of bats or birds or something like that. But if you, were, if you know that it is smoke, then you can be sure that that smoke is coming from fire. That's the only place smoke can come from. So when you know that two things are connected together that way, if you experience one of them, then you know that the other one has to be happening somewhere. It has to be present somewhere. So wherever there is smoke, there is fire. Now, the reality is smoke and fire have a particular relationship. Not everything in the world has this same kind of relationship that is so precise and so reliable. But often we can use methods of inference to assist us to understand what's going on. The third method is upaman or analogy. This is a little less reliable because it is where you try to understand a situation by getting an analogous situation understood. The examples in Ayurveda that are characteristic are the three ways that the tissues are nourished in the body. The first is Kedari Kulya Nyaya, meaning that tissues are nourished uh, like a field with furrows in it. If you 
pour water into the field. The water will flow along the furrows. It will go into all the all of the plants that are planted in the in the field, and they will get watered that way. And this is very similar to what happens with the circulation of the blood and the lymph and so on. Then there is Kale Kapodha Nyaya, the, uh, the, the law of the pigeon. And so the pigeon is flying along, dropping some grain here and there, and the grain falls down, it finds a place to grow, and it grows. And this is more similar to, let's say, for example, secretions of endocrine glands, hormones. They come from here, but they wander around in the body. They find something, and then they assist that tissue to, to grow or heal or whatever it needs to do because they have been, they've been wandering around as if carried by a pigeon, and they have landed somewhere. And the third is, Kshira Dadi Nyaya, the law of milk and yogurt. In this case, all of the milk is inoculated with the yogurt culture, and it all of it turns into yogurt. And in a way, that's what happens with the juice that gets absorbed into the bloodstream. It mixes with the blood. It turns into blood. It's converted into blood completely. So these are ways of understanding. They, they are not direct experience. They are not direct inference, but they're ways of understanding how things might be. And they do require a greater amount of intuition. All of these methods require intuition in order to be confirmed. But this requires more intuition because it's not quite so direct. The fourth method is aptavakya or aptopadesha. That means the ter testimony of experts. That word apta is a past participle. That means something that has happened. It comes from the root op, and op means to go beyond, to arrive, to achieve, <clears throat> to come to the end of. So an apta is a person that has gone to the end of a particular type of knowledge. And we can rely on them because they've got to the end of it. Now, the end of it does not mean that they know everything that can be known because no one can know everything that can be known for all time. It's simply impossible. What, what this means more precisely is they have gone through the process of becoming so familiar with their subject that they are aligned with the subject and the subject, whatever the, the 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 vidya, that shakti, that is working through them, is so aligned with them that that shakti, much or most of the time, will be conveying accurate information through them. Of course, this is even less guaranteed than the other three methods because sometimes the expert may be having a bad day. Experts also have ego and sometimes they that ego may, may be perverting what's going on in their minds. But these are the four ways and other, other uh, Indian sciences have different, different numbers of methods and they describe them slightly differently. But basically, even today, these are the four basic main ways that we have for understanding what's going on. These are rational mind ways. So we need to rely, we certainly, especially nowadays, need to have rational minds that work effectively and efficiently. We need also to make sure that the heart is working. So we need to be testing that whatever is being conveyed to us is coming from a place. It doesn't have to be someone who is gushing with emotion, but it has to be someone whose heart is sufficiently open that they are in touch with their own emotions 
so that there is a greater potential for them to be communicating something accurately. Now, in the case of people like doctors, uh, this is something that for a, a, a real legitimate doctor, it was always expected that they would be connected to their emotions. And sadly, nowadays, many of them are not. Lawyers rarely are connected to their emotions. Politicians, of course, as Vimal Ananda used to say, have to put their conscience on the shelf. So you always have to, for example, be suspicious of what a politician says. Though, when in the case of the person who has been the head of state of the United States for the past four years, when you learn that that individual has delivered 30,000 lies in public over the past four years, that's a an average of 20 lies per day. You have to suspect that this person is someone who is not in touch with anything other than his image of what he wants to project. And you should, in my opinion, be extremely suspicious about believing anything such a man would say. Because we can be sure that such a man does not have any kind of connection to the truth if he is able to lie so effectively, so religiously, so ruthlessly. What would be ideal is to understand something rationally, to feel the rightness of it emotionally, not get all excited about how things might be, because of course, emotion, people can be led astray by emotion also. The German population was led astray by the emotion of Adolf Hitler, who told them that he would make Germany great again. And you see what happened to Germany as a result of being led astray by someone who spoke to the emotions of an entire nation. So in addition to the head and the heart, we also have to use the hara, the intuition, down below the navel. We have to open this, we have to learn how to work with it so we can intuitively ask ourselves, is this plausible? Is this something that could actually ex exist? And if so, then we have to continue asking questions about whether it does exist or not. This is extremely, especially important nowadays because of such a great amount of fake news that is being prepared, fake videos, fake audios, fake everything. Everything can be spoofed, everything can be imitated. And so very soon it's gonna be difficult. There will be all kinds of things being put out, being, being, in, presented as if they have come from so-and-so, when in fact, they have simply been generated by someone who wants so-and-so to be seen in a particular light. So the question of what is real and what is unreal is one that is even more difficult nowadays than ever before. And for this purpose, there are many things that have to be acknowledged. And one thing, of course, is that we always have to ask lots of questions. So you need to come up with a set of questions, whatever those questions might be, and you need to ask them regularly. You need to ask, who is benefiting from anything that you read? on the internet. Who is benefiting from this? What are they getting out of this? Always be suspicious because people are posting things on the internet because they have agendas. Those agendas might be good. Those agendas might not be good. So try to discover the individual's agenda. Once you have discovered the agenda, use your common sense. 
evaluate whether what they say, what they're displaying, sounds right to you, whether intuitively it feels right to you. If it seems to be feeling right, then it's time to check many other sources and don't check sources that are simply that you find on their website or some, someone else's website. That puts you into the echo chamber. That puts you into the place where you're only going to be hearing the same thing from many different sources. And people will say, well, I went on and I did the research. You didn't do any kind of research. All you did was you got into a domain and then you started going from one site to another site in that domain and people started to tell you a particular lie again and again over and over and once a person has heard a lie often enough then and they hear it from people that they seem to be reliable they start to, it it's easy to start to believe that that lie is actually true so if you and this is this is something that is appropriate for everyone if you have a more leftist bent of in your politics spend some time always looking at right-sided right-wingish websites also get different perspectives on the same reality if you have more of a right-wingish kind of perspective, look at leftist websites also. Always get different perspectives. There are always two sides, at least, to every story. Don't look for balanced reporting. Look for accurate reporting. Focus on the evidence. When, you, when something is presented as evidence, Try to confirm that evidence from somewhere else. Consider the source. Remember that something, and I tell you, I can't tell you how many people come to me, people I've known for 30 and 40 years, and they say, oh, this must be true. And I said, well, why should it be true? Well, it came to me on Facebook. And I said, what does that prove? Well, but how could it not be true? It could easily not be true. There's plenty of reasons for it not to be true. Simply because it comes to you from someone you trust does not mean what they are sending to you is accurate. Always be suspicious. S pay attention to fact-checking sites. Find one or two that you like and Keep using them. Keep finding out what is, and something that appears to be too good to be true, remember, almost always is too good to be true. So, one thing that you should remember, of course, is that it is easy to start to feel overloaded and to feel that you you simply cannot determine what is accurate. When you get into a space like that, the first thing to do is remember to breathe. Breathe calmly. Breathe slowly. And then reconnect yourself to whatever it is that is your ishta, is your personal deity. Now, that personal deity could be the supreme reality with no qualities. It could be a mountain. It could be a star. It could be anything. But it's that one thing that is at the center of your being. That thing that you are going to remember last when you were drowning in the middle of the ocean. The last thing that's going to be in your awareness once, just before your awareness disappears. That is the basis of who you are. And that always needs to be refined. You need, because ultimately, it is that thing that is connecting you to the supreme reality. Always look through that thing to the supreme reality. That will be beneficial for you and for that thing, whatever it happens to be. Always go in that direction. And what is the supreme reality? 
awareness. It's awareness that has no limitations of any kind of attitude, any kind of preference, any kind of opinion. It is simply examining things clearly, quietly, passively, allowing the mind to be open, not jumping to conclusions, perceiving things as best you can, understanding things as best you can, not jumping to conclusions, not immediate, because, of course, everything is moving much faster nowadays. And definitely someone who wants you to believe a particular story, that person is going to tell you that it's urgent that you it it ha, you have to believe this right now it's critical the the if this this is our last chance this is otherwise everything the entire world is going to completely explode implode fall apart dissolve or something else it in this way it's just like salesmanship you have to act now so if the more someone says you have to believe some way right now, the less you should believe them. Unless, of course, it is God himself or herself who has shown up and say, you must believe in the supreme reality right now, in which case you bow down and say yes. But that is an unusual experience, and we can that's not the run-of-the-mill experience that you are going to have. The experience you're going to have is lots of people with agendas, trying to get you to believe in a particular way so that you will, con you will co uh, contribute your prana, your attention, and you'll contribute your money. Maybe you'll contribute your body so that you will be out there on the barricades fighting for whatever it is they want you to fight for. So remember very carefully that there are lots of agendas out there. There are many people who want to use those agendas to manipulate you. They are interested in you. They are interested in you because you have attention, you have money, you have, you're, you're a resource. You're something that can be plucked like a fruit. You're something that can be reaped like grain. You're something that can be consumed. You're something that, and that's why they want us to be consumers like termites, so that we can be consumed just as we are consuming things. Instead, remain as calm as possible. Keep your mind as clear as possible. Don't spend too much time looking at any kind of news. Pay attention to what is necessary. Pay attention to what is important. And try to keep your attention focused on what you have known to be true. Because when you know something to be true, when you, when you have experienced it, when you have seen it, when you, when, when you personally have had that experience, in the future, you can test inside yourself, whether something that is in front of you right now is making you feel the way that you felt when you had that previous experience that you absolutely discovered was one million percent true. Now, sometimes it's as a, an experience as simple as I, uh, I looked at a, a red chili and I did not know what the red chili was like, and I bit into the red chili enthusiastically, and lo and verily, the red chili was really, really, really hot. But now you have learned something. You have had personal experience. This is a red, now, not all red chilies will be equally hot, but you have learned that this red chili, very likely, is going to be hot. You have also learned that if a stove is hot and you put your finger on the stove and you hold it down, you will burn your finger. You don't have to do this too many times to know that anything that is hot, you should keep your hands away from. This is direct perception that you cannot argue with because your flesh will not permit you to argue with it. So that is real. That is true. That's the level 
of experience that you want to have when you are saying, I am having a particular experience. Not, oh, I'm having, I'm having experience up here. Some, no, it needs to be a in the body experience. It needs to be felt to be true in order for you to be able to conclude that it is true. So this is Dr. Robert wishing you truth and reality. Om, Om Namah Shivaya. Mm-hmm.